Welcome to Trashy Divorces. Hey, everybody. Another week. We're back for another week of Trashy Divorces. Another day. bit of trash candy for you. This week, stars fell on Alabama. Doing two kind of interesting stories this week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. First, though, Stars Fell on Alabama, one of my very favorite songs. I know it. Yeah, you've got family. It's my grandparents' n- song. Nostalgia. Actually. It's a 1934 jazz standard composed by Frank Perkins with lyrics by Mitchell Parrish. It has been recorded by everyone. One of the first versions was the Guy Lombardo Orchestra. Who's done this song? Bing Crosby, Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong, John Coltrane, Jimmy Buffett, Billie Holiday, Anita O'Day, Frank Sinatra, Doris Day, everybody has covered this jazz standard, Stars Fell on Alabama. Mm -hmm. Fantastic little song. So this week we had a little homage to our Homish states of Alabama. States. I grew up there. It's yeah, my home you, state. Yeah, yeah we're, we're not picking on Alabama here. It's just that Alabama, like, there are fascinating things about, like, I, I've got political scandal. You've got, like, this historical quirk that I'd never heard of. Got, it was, it's kind of a fun week on it's Trashy Divorces. really, really interesting. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, if you know the weird thing about my story, you definitely have a PhD in Trashy Divorces. Yeah. Because it was brand new information to me. Yeah. All right, before we get started with our stories, what happened on Patreon this week? A lot. A lot. A lot happened. The live show. Y'all, we did the live show last Sunday. It was amazing. Thanks to you who came out. It was incredible. Thanks to those of you who supported us from afar. It was amazing and super fun. We actually are going a little next door for today, but in our live show, we covered Georgia divorces. We Stacey, did. We who'd did. you do? Um, I had a uh, former Atlanta Brave. He's He's been to other places. He's a San Diegan now, but David Justice was a big deal for the Braves the years that they became a powerhouse. And he was married to Halle Berry. He sure was. For a handful of years. That was a fun, trashy divorce. Yep. I actually covered the trashy died before they could get divorce mm. of the founder of the Girl Scouts, Juliet Gordon Lowe. Mm-hmm. That was amazing. That whole live show in its entirety, that came out on Patreon this week. We also did our trashy tidbits with the kitchen sink. You brought us all kinds of updates on... Bethany Frankel, still married to Jason Hoppy, it turns crazy out. Crazy pants. I guess that's just gonna... Whatever. And uh, Kim Davis, the county clerk in Rowan County, that's Kentucky. It. She had a little uh, bit of news this a week. A little bit of good news, bad news situation for her. I did uh, a little update on our friend Taylor Swift and Lizzo, too. Oh, what else happened on Patreon? Our final mm. fun with done for now. Yep. On the 10th anniversary of his passing, we talked about his years from 2001 to his death in 2009, including the suit by Gary Condit and all the dish about his last novel, Too Much Money. Oh, what else? It was a big week on Patreon. Yeah, yeah. I put up my uh, bonus divorce with Peter Thomas Roth, who is a skincare tycoon. Magnet. Magnate. Sure. Skincare guy, uh, also collector of weird memorabilia and his divorce from his wife, Noreen, just it spider webs out into a so whole crazy. bunch of people we've touched on in Trashy Divorces. It was it was really weird. So it was a good story. Could not not tell that one. So lots of good stuff happening over on Patreon. Who is in our magic mirror this week? Who joined us? Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Tracy Vander S, Bethany GC, Aaron, Amanda G. Donna C. R.P. Teresa. Heather S. Kayla H. Megan S. Sandy R. In Stewart. Robin L. Stacy L. Probably no relation. Cat T. Georgia Grace H. Tom T. Stephanie H. K. Michelle. Colleen C. Hillary B. Deborah M. Sarah Linda P. Megan M. And Yen L. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so everybody. much. Everybody, welcome to our little team trash candy over on the patreon community hope y'all are enjoying it definitely and we've got crazy fun stuff coming up this week new slew of trashy tutors trashy tidbits and i'm hot and heavy on my bonus divorce as well so thanks everybody again for joining us over there stacy you about ready to fall some stars on alabama (laughs) I, i really really am this is this is awesome so let's go 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 let's do it Stacy, you got a Alabama trashy divorce this week? I do, I do. 
a big one. It made a lot of news a few years ago. I remember this. I remember distinctly not reading much about it because everything I read was so trashy. Because you know, I'm one, like, I just can't. You know, one day I'd do the research for you and make well, it all had better. Well, invented trashy divorces yet? Yes. Yeah. So I have the story of former Alabama Governor Robert Bentley no. and his former wife, Diane Bentley. And there's got to be a way to rhyme yellow hammer and scandal like yellow hammer scanda i don't know i i don't know workshopping it but that's my title <laughs> work on that yeah. rammer scammer rammer scammer that might work rammer scammer yellow hammer maybe rammer scammer yellow hammer that that's cool that's cool so depending on where you live and how closely you follow politics news you may or may not recall the sex scandal that swept up the Alabama governor a few years ago and toppled his administration as scandals go, it was pretty banging. There were audio tapes that Robert Bentley's now ex-wife Diane had recorded of him and his staffer slash mistress that um, somehow made it to the media, meaning oh, no. that there were hilariously awkward exchanges with the press. So Bentley was insisting that he had not had an affair. And the reporters would be like, so what did you mean when you said, I worry about loving you so much? And he's like... I love everyone on my staff. Oh, my God. So gosh darn much. <laughs> Jeez. So what you may not realize is that the disclosure of the affair between Bentley and his staffer was almost incidental, and it stemmed from an entirely separate scandal involving the Speaker of the Alabama House of Representatives. So Bentley like tries to improperly influence this ongoing investigation into this guy, Mike Hubbard, the Speaker of the House. Okay. And in retaliation... Like, the state's top law enforcement official, like, blew the whistle on his affair. Oh. <laughs> this is dirty politics in Alabama. Tangled web. Tangled web. It's a bonzo story about the corrupting power of power. You might want to pour a glass of something for this one. I got crystal light. Do I need wine? I mean... Okay. Like most of the South... Alabama is a rock-solid one-party state, and lately that party is the Republican Party. Sure. But to be clear, corruption is entirely bipartisan, and when the Democratic Party was the controlling party, it was just a slightly different set of good old boys looting the state treasury. Actually, if we're being honest, it's the same politically connected business interests getting the favors doled out, whatever the letter after the elected official's name may be. Yeah. It is a corrupt state. It all, we are both... We both spent part of our childhoods there it's a corrupt state it's got a corrupt government and it always has for all the good things about alabama there are some things that are not so good as well hmm. so robert bentley who would become the governor was born february 3rd 1943 okay he became a doctor he did a stint in the Air Force, and then he opened a successful chain of dermatology clinics around the Southeast. Oh, okay. So he's like a physician and a successful businessman and all of that stuff. He had hard scrabble roots growing up in the town of Columbiana, which I'd never heard of. Wow. This is in Shelby County. Shelby, okay. Which I have heard of as in Shelby County v. Holder, which gutted the Voting Rights Act during his governor. Just bringing up all it's the really, good times. There's a lot. There's a lot here. As a child, like for a time, the family lived in a house with no electricity or running water. You know, it was like the 40s and 50s in Col rural Alabama. Yeah, Columbiana today has 4,000 people in it. Oh, wow. And I guess it's possible it was slightly bigger than I, but I doubt it. Anyway, Bentley goes on to attend the University of Alabama. Roll Tide. Where he met his wife, Diane. She, I don't have her birth date, I apologize. So he's an Aquarius and she was born a year it's later. a mystery. She's a mystery. <laughs> I mean, she does not take his shit, apparently. So good for her. All right. So she is a year younger. She's a Montgomery native. And she was at Bama studying bacteriology in the early 60s. Wow. Which struck me that she is probably not the kind of person who went to college to get the fabled MRS degree. The you Not know. if you're studying bacteria. I would think. Yeah, I think they probably met through a science class as he was studying to become a physician. And like, seems interesting. Seems, again, like, just there's very little about her. She's not like a super public person. But what, what I did read made me think very highly of her. Bacteria. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, she, and she married one, so... 
<laughs> you might not see them, but they're there. They're there. They married in 1965. They had four sons together. And after he got out of the Air Force, they uh, made their home in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, home of the University of Alabama. Right. Okay. This is a really good resume for an aspiring politician in a largely rural state. Like, he's the, he's the town doctor, you know? Like, it's a really good resume. So in 98, he runs for a state Senate seat, lost by 58 votes. Like, it was super close. In 02, he finally wins his state house seat. He gets 65% of the vote. Wow, that's impressive. So, yeah, good, good margins there. So the southern states transitions from reliably Democratic governance to reliably Republican governance has played out on different timelines per state. So, like, in Georgia... The GOP had majority control of the executive and legislative branches by 2004. And, like, I can't think of the last time that we won a statewide office. We, we Democrats won a statewide office in Georgia. Like it, in Alabama, it took until 2010. Oh, wow. And this followed some significant ethical problems by prominent Democrats in the state, including a seven-year jail sentence for former Democratic Governor Don Siegelman. Oh, God. Yeah. And that prosecution was a little wonky like Karl Rove was personally involved in it apparently but the story has everything it really I mean yeah but yeah they went after him hard several of the things that he was convicted of were upheld by an appeals court so I think he was corrupt it's just the prosecution was also tainted but he served time like he served years of time rammer scammer <laughs> yellow hammer yep I think he's still on probation actually okay so Siegelman, corrupt, Democrats, whatever. This, along with Fox News fear-mongering about Barack Obama being an arugula-eating Muslim socialist gun grabber who enjoyed spicy mustard and death panels, set the stage for the 2010 Republican campaign in Alabama, which was a smashing success. Okay, in the, in the legislative branch, I think the party surprised even itself. So this is where we bring in this guy, Mike Hubbard, who becomes the Speaker of the House in Alabama after the 2010 election. He is an Auburn area businessman. War Eagle. Been in the state house since 98. And he orchestrates this bare knuckled, very Newt Gingrich esque campaign against the corruption of the Alabama Democratic Party. He even had, like, you know, Gingrich had the contract with America. This dude had, I think he called it the Republican handshake with Alabama, was oh. his. But I think he sort of created a statewide slate of candidates and made it, you know, like just self-evident to voters that they should vote for the not corrupt ones, the right? Republican handshake. Yeah. <laughs> so dirty. You should definitely wash after. <laughs> so dirty. <laughs> okay. So yeah, like with, you know, two years into Obama and Fox News and voters nationwide were primed to toss Democrats out of office. Boy, did they in Alabama. The Republicans, who had not held power in the state since Reconstruction, like literally 1874 wow. is the last time Republicans were in control, they get a supermajority in the House, and they make Mike Hubbard speaker. <laughs> How'd that go? Wow. There was prison time involved. Yikes. <laughs> Item number one on Mike Hubbard's list is a tough new ethics law that is designed to prevent all of the self-dealing... <laughs> that all of the Democrats had been doing prior. Sure. Right. And like like nationwide ethics watchdogs were like, wow, that's a that's a tough law. That's like A plus. Good good good, good looking good job. out. There. Yeah. <laughs> Once that was out of the way, definitely not corrupt Mike Hubbard doubled the budget for the speaker's office and lined the place with flat screen TVs all over the walls. One of them was exclusively dedicated to showing a loop of pictures of Mike Hubbard with prominent national Republicans. Oh. So, uh, it's like the political equivalent of bling. Yikes. <laughs> Hubbard's tenure as speaker was arguably awful for the state. They passed a law in 2010 directing police to arrest anyone they suspected of being an illegal immigrant. This resulted in the arrest of several Honda and Mercedes executives at their factories in the state. No. The law was later declared unconstitutional. They passed a law requiring state-issued IDs to vote, which I think a lot of people are like, no bigs, pretty easy to get. And then they passed another law to shut down most of the driver's license offices in the state. Yeah, smooth move. <laughs> On purpose. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah. Yeah. On the personal side... 
because Mike Hubbard is really, really corrupt. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Like the he he ended up with twenty three felony counts. <laughs> Oh my God! Really? Twenty <laughs> oh, three? Yeah, this is just a brief overview. There was all sorts of shady shenanigans on the personal side. Hubbard, and I'm using air quotes here, wrote a book in 2012 called "Storming the State House: The Campaign That Liberated Alabama from 136 Years of Democrat Rule," all about this like anti-corruption campaign that swept his party into power. Okay. He paid a ghostwriter $96,000 of taxpayer funds for it. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> it's really... Boy. In other words, things are going exactly as they always had in Montgomery. Wow. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. <laughs> Hubbard's profound and prolific corruption had drawn the attention of state investigators, and by late 2014, when Robert Bentley was on the ballot for a second term as governor... Mike Hubbard was under indictment for violating that very ethics law that he had championed as his first order of business. Prosecutors alleged that he had used his office and party leadership role to enrich his own businesses, to push bills on behalf of his consulting clients, and basically to act exactly like all of the Democrats that he had chased out of office. Government as usual. <laughs> Just, whew. Ironically, emails turned up where this dude is like sarcastically bemoaning the ethics bill like his ethics bill to the former governor of the state like who proposed those things <laughs> what were they thinking oh. in the end mike hubbard's legal strategy was to argue in court that his ethics law was unconstitutional and it did not work <laughs> he got convicted so if you're thinking that alabamians were actually voting on corruption in 2010 you would be wrong Two months after Hubbard was indicted, he was returned to the state house in a landslide in his what? district. Oh, yeah. Voters were incensed. Deep state. I don't know. Like, I really don't know what. 23 felony counts and we're going to elect you back into office? Yeah. Okay. And once he was there, I think this is even worse because, like, you can fool the, you know, like, whatever. But this this part's worse. The house reelected him speaker... 99 to 1. I, okay. That is owning the libs 2015 style. Like, oh, we know you're corrupt, but you're one of ours. You're corrupt on our team. Yeah. Uh, it's gross. It's gross. And he and Robert Bentley were trying to get some no-bid contracts out for a private prison. To, like, there was a lot. These two were shady and working together to be shady. Just terrible. Okay. So that's Mike Hubbard's role in kicking off this scandal for Robert Bentley, right? Like, he is just so corrupt that state investigators have no choice but to, like, hey, we're going to have to do something <laughs> outside of the bounds. Okay. Bentley wins re-election in 2014. So he's been married 40, 50 years at 50. this point? In, in August of 2015, yes, his wife of 50 years, Diane, shocks the Alabama political world and just the world in general by filing for divorce from the sitting governor of the state. She's the first lady. She cites irretrievable breakdown and just sort of leaves it at that. It's just, a, it's a mystery after 50 years together. So everybody is like, <laughs> uh, we're going to learn more about this, aren't we? <laughs> so, so the thing, part of it is there is already so much scandal swirling in Montgomery because of the Hubbard stuff. Right. And in June of 2015, the Supreme Court ruled that gay marriage was legal. Sure. And it's worth noting that the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court at the time is a dude named Roy Moore, who uh, you may have heard of. Yeah. So Roy Moore, allegedly a lawyer, is like telling the county clerks in the state that the ruling doesn't apply to Alabama. Because sure. that's how the law works. Okay. Um, he's not very good at law, it turns out. <laughs> so there were like ethics charges against him. And there was like national media was in town, like filming county clerks, like the, the window, the counter where you would talk to a clerk. They just had like the blinds drawn. They just wouldn't. There are still a few county clerks offices in Alabama that just don't. Just never open back up. Yeah. Wow. They just don't open. Okay. Whew. A lot going on. Really. Like. Um, <laughs> take a breath. Taking a breath. 2015 was a 
big year for Alabama Scannell. I just can't make the rhyme work. There's got to be a way. It's no. I'm going to think of this tomorrow after this is out. That we always do. Gonna just, uh, okay. In early 2016, because, you know, corrupt politicians look after each other, right? So a political operative accuses the guy who's investigating Mike Hubbard of leaking grand jury info uh, as a way to smear the speaker, right? Like, it's all deep state. It's whatever. I'm sure they weren't using that term yet, but that's the gist of it. The investigator is a guy named Matt Hart, who I think was like military intelligence prior to this and is not one to be trifled with. He just doesn't play. So Hart goes to the head of an agency. I am not kidding. This thing is called the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency. Aaliyah. Okay. I I guess Aaliyah. Anyway, Hart goes to the head of this not creatively named agency and is like, need you to look into these allegations against me. And then I need you to give the prosecutors in this case a report of your findings because he knows he didn't do it like he he's look away but let's do this like let's get this cleared up because we got to prosecute this guy because he's corrupt so sure enough the the law enforcement agency looks into it they sign an affidavit saying like nope no misconduct here all good and this is where robert bentley kind of ends his career so Bentley, like, announces that he's furious that the law enforcement agency would create this affidavit. He didn't approve that. So he fires the head of the agency and says that he probably misused state dollars, right? <laughs> you look confused. I'm so confused. I'm, I'm sorry. Aaliyah was investigating who and said there was no wrongdoing. They looked into the investigator. So a political operative pops up in 2016 and is like, the investigator is leaking grand jury info. Got it. So that like, because he's, the idea was that he was fabricating a case against totally not corrupt Mike Hubbard, who was totally corrupt. So it's just the Alabama political establishment closing ranks and trying to protect its corrupt speaker. Got it. Okay. I'm sorry. There's, yeah. there's a lot going on. I know. On. I know. I tried to, believe me, I narrowed this down a lot. Um. There's a lot. Okay, so no wrongdoing. Now I'm going to fire you for saying there's no wrongdoing. That's exact. So yeah, so the investigator is like, please clear up these allegations against me so we can proceed with our prosecution of the corrupt Speaker of the House. And so those allegations are investigated. They're baseless. And then the governor is like, you, you didn't ask me if you could investigate those allegations. You're fired. Like, yeah. Because I guess he couldn't fire Mike Hart, the deputy attorney general. <laughs> I don't know. The head of the agency is a guy named Spencer Collier. And Spencer Collier, upon learning that he's being fired, is like, oh yeah? Watch this fuckhead. So he calls a press conference and he tells the world that he has seen text messages, sexy text messages, and heard audio of Robert Bentley's conversations with his staffer, Rebecca Mason, and that those two are totally doing it and have been for years. What? Mm -hmm. Like... Oh, my God. And so then, because the universe is always conspiring in our favor, those audio recordings are leaked to the press the next day. Oh, no. Woo! Oh, it's awkward. It's so awkward. March 23, 2016, AL.com, which is a really good news site. Like, I end up there a lot. So. I used it, too, okay. as a source. Yeah. Yep. AL.com publishes, like, the audio. And... Yellowhammer News <laughs> publishes transcripts and audio, and Cliff Sims at Yellowhammer News explained how these recordings came to be. Quote, Then First Lady Diane Bentley, suspicious that her husband, Governor Robert Bentley, was having an affair with his senior advisor, Rebecca Mason, on multiple occasions pressed record on her cell phone, left the room, and captured the governor having intimate conversations with his mistress. So she's the one that recorded them? <sighs> and leaked to the press. Wow. And by now, she's divorced from him. Like, their divorce was final in September of 2015, I think. Okay. And the records were sealed. So like, it was done. It was a done deal. She's a single lady now. But she's coming back for All her... All single ladies. Revenge best served. Just a little bit cold with some mm -hmm. cassette tapes, too. Yeah. So wow. Understandably, this puts Robert Bentley in a bit of an awkward position. So he is flatly and comically denying that he had a sexual relationship with Rebecca Mason. The tape transcript is kind of what you would expect. And like, while I 
always feel weird. I usually don't read, like, I've never actually read these before, but I figured, I figured our listeners might want to hear some of the color. So what seems to have happened is that Diane and the governor in 2014 had gone to their Gulf Shores beach house and Diane had pressed record on her phone and set it down and told her husband that she was going for a walk on the beach. Nice. And he calls. <sighs> Back up. Ten seconds later, is she out the door? Basically. So here's just a few. But baby, let me tell you what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to start locking the door. If we're going to do what we did the other day, we're going to have to start locking the door. This guy is in his 70s at this point, I think, and has not figured out door locking, so. (laughs) Okay, another. What, baby? Oh, I do too, baby. I do, Rebecca. I just, I miss you. I wish I was with you right now. You know, it is, it is scary. I almost, I kind of, do you just start worrying about us a little bit? Wow. Yeah. You'd kiss me? I love that. You know I do love that. You know what? When I stand behind you and I, you know what? Like, it's I, just, stop. Mm-hmm. we're done. Cool. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so weirdly, at the time the scandal breaks, Robert Bentley is technically like single, right? Like his marriage is over. It's Rebecca Mason who is married. Um, Whoa, and- wait a minute. What? Yeah, I know. The story has everything. Okay. More importantly, not only is she on his staff, her husband, John Mason, also works for the governor. He earns $91,400 a year directing the governor's office of faith-based and volunteer services. Oh, my God. You cannot make, make it this up. up. Oh, my God. So good. Okay. Ethics watchdogs in the state pounced, building on Collier's allegations to accuse the governor of misusing state resources to facilitate his affair. One way that works out is that the sexting and phone conversations with Rebecca happened on his state-issued cell phone. And what he didn't know was that at some point, he and Diane had synced this with their iPad. And this is how his (laughs) wife... (laughs) this is how his wife learned that he was cheating on her by watching text messages flying between the two of them Uh, uh, it's not funny it's not funny at all but it's hilarious that's yeah Yeah. i mean if you're there are some people out there that cheating is actually the real turn on but it doesn't seem like that's the case here but. G- g- technology yo figure out technology if you want to keep your affairs secret kind of yeah God. uh rebecca mason uh-huh. resigned from the administration a, oh, yeah like really? a, week, <laughs> a week after the audio leaked <laughs> on march 30 2016 uh there were rumblings in the state house to impeach bentley uh, but by april the state house realized it had no procedures in place for impeachment oh my god so they had to like figure that out (laughs) it's like the gang who can't shoot straight but always always okay so a special prosecutor gets appointed the attorney general jumps in ultimately the ethics commission determines that bentley had probably committed four class b felonies including three campaign finance violations but let me guess it's alabama it's fine he they they got him to resign and enter into a plea agreement that prevents him from running for office in the future. Uh, the special prosecutor released a report in April of 2017. Pretty cringeworthy. It notes that the governor had routinely threatened his critics with criminal prosecution, because that's not an abuse of power. Humongous misconduct. Uh, and, <laughs> oh, it's so gross. Bentley once tried to get a member of his security detail to break up with Rebecca on his behalf. So, cool dude. I, okay. Yeah. I mean, bodyguard, you know? Got a job for you. Okay. So after his resignation on April 10, 2017, like five days after this report came out, (laughs) okay, shared with the world what just a scumbag he is, and the subsequent plea agreement that let him avoid jail time in, in exchange for not holding public office... He went back to practicing medicine. Rebecca Mason works as his office manager at his practice, the Dermatology Care of Alabama, earning 60000 a year. 
Bentley blames unspecified special interests for bringing his administration down because he is part of the party of personal responsibility. Those unspecified special interests wouldn't be his own penis, would they? (laughs) It was Apple. (laughs) Mike Hubbard, the Speaker of the House, was convicted on 12 felony counts in July 2016 and was sentenced to four years in prison, eight years on probation, and ordered to pay $210,000 in fines. He remains free on bond and is fighting to have the state investigate the investigators as well as the jury that convicted him. It turns out that it turns out that even when every lever of power in the state is controlled by Republicans, deep state conspiracies abound. Spencer Collier, the fired head of the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency, find a better name, sued Bentley for wrongful termination. That litigation is ongoing. But depositions, I guess, are public records in Alabama. So every time they sit down, there's more headlines. Diane, poor Diane, spent half a century with this dude, caught him cheating. It's shameful. Recorded him cheating. And let the media know. She got the beach house. Good for her. <laughs> like in Gulf Shores? Yep. Good. Yep, yep. So she is said to be enjoying time with the kids and grandkids at the Gulf Shores house. Living at the beach. That's she, fantastic. Mm-hmm, she splits her time between Gulf Shores and Tuscaloosa. She's a private person and not one to chase the spotlight, but she was quoted in the media in October of 2018 saying, I like to say that I once was first lady of Alabama and I'm not first anymore, but I'm still a lady. And I still want to represent the state of Alabama as a lady. And Good for, for that, her. we Diane. applaud you, ma'am. Yep. Get a little trashy divorces halo for all that. For sure. I don't know. Do we want to do trash cans right now? Because 23 class A felony trash cans? I don't know. What you got? I gave him 2014 <laughs> state issued trash cans <laughs> for Robert Bentley. And the thoroughly corrupt government he led. Wow. Sorry, that was a lot. I mean, that, I, that was a lot. Do you have any points of, do I need to clarify? No, you, you, were, you, you were good. I got, you cleared it up for me in the place I got confused. Yeah. That's a hell of a trashy divorce. Yeah, it's a shame. It's that an, involved the whole fucking state. The whole fucking state. The whole fucking state. Let me see you if I actually. You can't just keep it all to yourself in the court. You're going to bring in everybody. Okay, here's, all right. So this is uh, one of the New York Times articles that I used for this quoted, um, A guy named David Mowry, who's a political consultant in Montgomery. This is so spot on. He says, when I first moved here, an older lawyer friend of mine told me there are 4,000 people in Alabama and 4 million extras. (sighs) And I think that's how they see themselves. Like, there is that, like, University of Alabama thing. Like, all the governors come from a particular I wouldn't say it's one university or the other. I would say it's a, a... very white man club in oh, Alabama. Oh, it sure is. It's a white man attorney club mm-hmm. in yeah, Alabama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 4,000 of them, apparently. Wow. Yeah. So, and then I guess this week we've learned that current Governor Kay Ivey, who, who followed him, did blackface when she was at Auburn. So, it's cool. It's cool. It's we hope people from Alabama continue to listen to us after this <laughs> episode of Trashy Divorces. There were a lot of you at our live show, so thank you for coming. There out. really were. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks for letting us uh, trash your home state, because. But it's our home state too. It's our I mean, home state too. Yeah. Also, like to, I'm gonna say pretty much every state. We could probably do the we same could thing with every Illinois. State and, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh my god, <laughs> Illinois has had more governments than Italy. I think. <laughs> like, anyway, corruption is pretty common at the state level, and. Sometimes it includes a trashy divorce. Oh, that was a hell of a trashy divorce. 2014 trash cans Mm -hmm. and a halo for Diane hanging out at a beach house. Yeah. I dig it. Yep. I dig it. Pour yourself a mimosa, Diane. That's right. Enjoy the day. So that's my trashy divorce. That was amazing. Let's take a break. We're going to come back with taking us back a little further in Alabama scandal when we come back from break. Boy, do the stars fall on that state. No lie. Hi, we're Eliza, Allison, and Carlin, and we're the hosts of Resolve Mysteries Podcast. Our podcast follows the 80s and 90s television show Unsolved Mysteries, hosted by Robert Stack. We have a love for true crime and the unsolved. If you don't remember Unsolved Mysteries, we forgive you, but you don't have to know to get into our show. If you like true crime stuff, ghost stuff, alien stuff, or just stories about weird shit like Bigfoot, this is your podcast. The stories we cover range from totally ridiculous to truly heartbreaking. We do detailed research on 
all of the segments that Unsolved Mysteries aired, then drink some wine and give you the latest updates on every case. We talk about stories that will leave you laughing, crying, and occasionally outraged. Resolve Mysteries podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite pods. Join us and perhaps you may be able to help solve the mystery. So, Alicia, you've got something a, a little different. Oh, entirely different today. I'm really excited to tell this story because this, okay, all of my best divorce knowledge, Stacey, comes from the 1939 film, The Women, <laughs> which in my opinion is one of the best films made in 1939, which was the year a lot of good films got made in Hollywood. Yeah. So pretty much every actress who was not cast in Gone with the Wind starred in The Women. Interesting. It was written, it was a uh, play written by Anita Luz. Starred Norma Shearer, Joan Crawford, Rosalind Russell, Paulette Goddard, Joan Fontaine, with even a little appearance by Hedda Hopper. <laughs> oh, sorry. There was one person in the cast of Gone with the Wind who did make an uncredited appearance in the 1939 film, Butterfly McQueen. So there okay. you go. Okay. Okay. So here I am, just rolling along with my life and my trashy divorce knowledge and thinking that, well, hell, I'm going to toss it out to y'all. And just shout out your answer in your car or office or pet walking or wherever you are. What do you think is the quickie divorce capital of the United States? Did y'all yell Reno? I was going to say, obviously, it's Reno, Nevada. Obviously, it's Reno, Nevada. No, it is not so. Brand new information. It turns out from 1945 to 1970, the state of Alabama was, in fact, the quickie divorce capital of the United States. You're going to have to explain more about... Oh, you know I'm gonna. Hold on to your socks, friends. Because, like, wasn't Arthur Miller heading to... He was uh, divorcing his wife in Reno so he could be with Marilyn Monroe in the 50s or sure. whatever? Like... Reno still was happening. All right. But... So when everybody knew about... Well... It depends. Okay. Undercover Alabama. Undercover Alabama. Okay. So you ready for the story? I, yeah. Alabama, born on December 14th, 1819, when it was admitted as the 22nd state into the Union, is a Sagittarius. I'm just kidding. I'm not doing that. Okay. In 1945, little old Alabama, in the heart of the Bible Belt, holder of all things sacred and heavenly bound, decided to loosen up the law a little bit and abolished the law that required a one-year residency before you could get a divorce. So there was no residency requirement? It was a loophole. They wrote out the loophole, no residence, no residency requirement. Okay. Well, the you had to be a resident for one year was tossed out. So if you could prove Alabama residency in five minutes, you could hang tight. This is just... So just you, a, you go get a library card. And you can get divorced in the state. Somebody so. did that. Hang tight. Yes. Hold on. You hadn't even gone to the trashy divorces bingo yet. Okay. So Alabama kills this law that you need a one-year residency. And there was some benefits uh, to this. Like, pretty much it was on. And what were some of those benefits uh, besides the dissolution of marriage faster than a day drinking session? Well, this policy not only made a fortune for the state of Alabama. Makes sense. Uh, but grifters going to grift. Turns out many Alabama state and national senators loved this new rule because they're a bunch of white dude attorneys. Oh, they're lawyers. With some high dollar Washington oh, high society contacts. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1945, people could just find buckets full of attorneys who would be very happy in return for your dollar dollar bills to perjure themselves and say, Sure, my client is a resident. Sure. Even if they've only been a resident for a few hours. They've been sitting on my porch for the last 20 minutes. We had a cocktail. It's fine. Let's get divorced. They live here. Okay. Divorce in Alabama had become so popular. This is an article I'm pulling from an article from the Gadsden Times, next door to my hometown in Anniston. The Gadsden Times on October 14th, 1956, wrote this. In recent years, Nevada's divorce rate has fallen consistently. In fact, there has been such a drop in tabloid fodder divorces that the New York Daily News has decided to close down its Reno Bureau. Yowza. <laughs> the fact is, for several years now, the easiest divorce terms in the nation are to be found not in Nevada, but in Alabama. 
a divorce seeker need only show up in Alabama long enough to meet a lawyer, pay a fee, fill out the papers, and wait a few hours. The lawyer shoots off usually to a rural county, hires a local lawyer to handle the court work, gets a decree, and hops back to his client. So, like, they went to a rural county because the judges were less, they just had more time on their calendar, basically, to sign stuff? Is it depends that... on who you knew. Depends on what corrupt lawyer, lawyer, we're hitting all kinds of counties in the examples I have. Okay, cool. Okay. In 1960, Alabama granted more than 17,000 divorces, whereas Nevada filed about 9,200. Wow. Okay. In 1962, even Time Magazine published an article called Alabama Unbound that sort of highlighted this. This was brand new information to me, and I even called like three or four of my Mm. trash candy superior sidewalk liquor people that it was two generations ago. Like this is out of our time loop. Sure. But this was the thing. Okay. I'm going to tell you about five super high profile Alabama divorces. One a year from 1956 to 1960. First up, 1956. Charles Adams and his second wife, Barb Adams. Who were they? Well, Charles Adams is the legendary cartoonist for the New Yorker magazine and also the creator of the much beloved Adams family. Oh. Also, Charles is kind of a ladies' man. He escorted Greta Garbo, Joan Fontaine, and even Jacqueline Kennedy on several social occasions. So Charles and Barb marry in 1954. This is his second marriage. And let me tell you a little bit about Barb. She is the inspiration for Morticia Adams. She is a practicing lawyer and whip smart in her own right. Wow. She is said to have combined Morticia-like looks with diabolical legal scheming. Wow. (laughs) She winds up controlling the Adams Family TV and film franchises. And even your Southern Fried True Crime, persuades Charles to take out a $100,000 life insurance policy on himself. (laughs) Now, Charles goes to a lawyer kind of on the side about this, and that lawyer later writes, I told him the last time I had word of such a move was in a picture called Double Indemnity starring Barbara Stanwyck, which I called to his intention, which is about, like, it's a good movie. I don't know if you've Mm -hmm. seen that recently, but... Double indemnity is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So Charles and Barb Adams. By 1956, the marriage is done. And well, did, he's concerned for his life, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> did you hear about that Alabama place? They are granted their divorce with the lengthy time period of a one day wait in Limestone County. Hmm. Okay. 1957. Lady Iris Mountbatten. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> what? The great granddaughter uh-huh. to Queen Victoria. So okay. Louis Mountbatten is older than she is. She's like his second cousin once removed. He's in the generation before. Okay. So okay. absolutely related. Iris Mountbatten is the great granddaughter to Queen Victoria. She totally makes a proper first marriage in 1941, which goes bust by 46. Lady Iris, by 1957, was totally smitten with an American jazz musician named Michael Neely Bryan. That's how they get you. Jazz guitar gets all the girls. <laughs> all. This dude played with all the greats. Benny Goodman, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker. That had a good start to the marriage in mm-hmm. 1957. But it didn't even make it to the end of 1957. Yikes. Because Lady Iris hot-footed herself to Alabama and got a divorce. Wow. Okay. Wow. Dude, 1958. (laughs) Grace Metallius, who is the author of Peyton Place. Grace was married in 1943, the tender age of 19, to George Metallius. They have three kids. She starts writing at the age of 30. Well, he's working and kind of busy, and she comes up with this scandalous book, That she calls Peyton Place. And this was mid 1950 scandal, like to the extreme. There's rape and incest and illicit affairs and teenage make. It is 
It's everything. And it's a scandal when it's released in 1956. The book is synonymous with sex and sin and scandal and was written about people in small New England towns where she's living. The book's a smash hit. It sells 100,000 copies in its first month of publication. Wow. At the time, the average sale Mm -hmm. for a first novel, 3,000 copies. 100,000 copies. Okay. Yeah. Peyton Place creamed by the critics, but not so much by the general public. Mm -hmm. And to the critics, Grace says, if I'm a lousy writer, then an awful lot of people have lousy taste. Even Tom Sawyer had a girlfriend, and to talk about adults without talking about their sex drives is like talking about a window without glass. Isn't that cl- I yeah. love it. Yeah. Okay. The estimate is that one in 29 Americans read the novel Peyton Place. Wow. So after the release of the novel in 1956, along comes Hollywood, and the movie Peyton Place premieres in 1957, starring Lana Turner. Not much is happening with the movie in 1957 until Lana Turner's daughter stabs Lana's boyfriend at the time, Johnny Stompanato. Uh, We're going to get Lana Turner's a future trashy divorce that I've been working on for ages. All right. So this scandal, Daughter Kills Boyfriend, makes the movie a hit. The movie ends up getting nominated for nine Academy Awards. Uh... Hold on. But you know TV. So like that person didn't die in vain? Is that where we're going? No, this is just scandal about Peyton Place that I found interesting. Yeah, was so you know TV wants a bite of that apple too. And in 1964, ABC launches a nighttime soap opera, Peyton Place, which launches the careers of Mia Farrow and Ryan O'Neill. Oh, fascinating. That run, that series runs till 1969. Okay. Okay. But we're here to talk about Grace. Okay. By 1958, with a little success from her book and some money, she is done with old George. And she comes on down to Alabama for a quickie divorce, which is granted. Grace remarries immediately to another dude, which lasts until 1960 when she divorces that guy and immediately remarries George again in 1960, only to divorce George again in 1963. It's like a real life Peyton place. And were all of these divorces handled in Alabama? I think just the first one. I think the original divorce from George. Because it sounds like she probably would have had residency by the time she got her out of the next divorce. No, she went back to New England. (laughs) Dude, there was a little bit of a scandal there. She's kind of fun. I may follow up on trashy tidbits with her because there was more fun stuff there that didn't necessarily pertain to the story. Okay, those are three. We got two more left. 1959. John Daly who is the host of the game show What's My Line, had been happily married since January 1937 to Margaret Griswell. They have three kids. Life is great. Until John Daly falls for a new gal. Hmm. You can't make this up. He starts an affair with Virginia Warren, the daughter of Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Earl Warren. Warren. Oh, my God. And it turns out John Daly wants to marry old Virginia. And hell, daddy has some contacts. Let's have a drink with some of those Alabama senators and get this shit on the move. So Daly's first marriage was done in 1959. Granted, divorce granted in Crenshaw County. John and Virginia Warren were married in 1960. A little bit of a happy ending here. They had three additional children and remained happily married until his death in 1991. Wow. Okay. Well, that, okay. again, when it works out, I mean, it does change the, like, kind of trashy divorce aspect of it. So. But capital, Alabama, divorce yeah. capital. Okay. I had no idea. No, this is the best one. They don't cover this in Alabama history. They when sure as hell don't. Elementary school or whatever. I did not learn this. Mm-hmm. It's trashy divorces teaching you all the good shit, friends. Okay. 1960. This is probably the most high-profile one in this story. That of Athena Mary Lavanos Onassis Spencer Churchill. Nic- there are a lot of names Nicaros. in there. Yeah, dude. I heard Onassis. Tina Onassis. I heard yeah. Onassis and Churchill. Tina. Tina Onassis. She's the daughter of Greek shipping magnate Stavros Livanos. 
And she divorces her husband, Aristotle Onassis, Ooh. in Washington County, Alabama in 1960. Hmm. Now, let me tell you about this. Tina hires State Senator Pierre Pelham of Mobile to handle her divorce. All right. Now, Pierre Pelham, Southern boy, who always wears white linen or seersucker suits, but don't let that Alabama twang fool you. He was Harvard educated and would go on to become president pro tem of the Alabama Senate. Wow. Okay. Now, Pierre, because she's a very high profile client, is taking this very seriously. And he wants to ensure that there are no problems. So Tina actually comes to Alabama for an entire week. He wants her to really be a resident. So, so like, he's she's not a, exactly She's lying. a long timer. Long timer. Now, Tina in 1946, at the age of 17, marries a much, much older Aristotle Onassis, who by 1960 is carrying on a hot and heavy affair in front of the whole world with opera legend Marie Callas. Wow. Mm -hmm. And Tina, not so much into that. Yeah, I'm really surprised. Yeah, so with a banjo on her knee, Tina gets on down to Alabama rents a penthouse apartment in the Creighton Towers Complex in Mobile, right off Spring Hill Avenue. Okay. Pays for a whole year of rent. Hmm. I mean, that's actually a great strategy for proving your intention. Pierre Pelham really wants to make this legit. So they head on down to the Mobile Public Library. Oh, my God. And she gets a library card. Yeah. Oh, there's also some touring through the area. So Pierre and Tina head on down to Dauphin Island one day. Sure, sure. And she buys herself a nice lot there to build a nice little beach house in Alabama, which surprisingly enough never happens. Stunning. <laughs> yeah. So this rolls on for like a week. And after they check out some books and buy some property, they head on over to Washington County, divorce granted in about five minutes. The very best part about this divorce is a little piece I came across on AL.com about a 19-year-old kid, Bobby Deneef, who was a sophomore at Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama, who got a nice gig over his summer break. His good friend, Pierre Pelham, in June of 1960, asked Bobby, like, hey, I, I got a thing for you to do. Could you show for this really important person around all week in this big-ass Cadillac? Yeah. And Bobby's like, hell yeah. The pay is $1,000 for a week of work. In 60? In 1960. That's that's a healthy chunk of change. In today's dollars, old Bobby made about $8,500 mm-hmm. that week. And cost of living there has always been low. Oh, yeah. So. This, that $1,000 a week was more than three times his whole monthly salary of $300 working at the business supply store while he attended college. Who do you think Bobby's driving around? Tina Onassis. Yeah. Right. He says about her, she was a beautiful lady. She was very nice. I thought it was very exciting. She was very well dressed and had a diamond ring that was like a headlight. Bobby, sh- like, yeah. let's go to Dolphin Island. Let's go to the library. Yeah. It's cool. Okay. okay. So that's the last of the high profile divorces I'm covering for this story. Sure. But corruptor's going to corrupt. Well, ride- that's, I'm fascinated. Yeah. Like, how, how did this happen and how did this stop happening? So the ride can't last forever. And by 1961, there is an effort which fails to actually pass the state legislature to reinstate the residency requirement. That doesn't work. But the Bar Commission of Alabama is like, "Er, we're going to add a new rule in our code of ethics prohibiting attorneys from participating in quickie divorces. A lot of lawyers who were pretty... So so they can't profit off it anymore. So they can't profit off of it anymore. People who were still doing it end up getting disbarred. Mm -hmm. So it kind of starts clamping it down for a while. By 1967... The practice had really stalled for ethical lawyers, except in one county, Geneva County, where quickie divorces are still a big time thing. But in the summer of 1970, two circuit court judges and seven others, including local lawyers, their secretaries, and a court registrar were indicted. Like for fraud type of stuff? 
Well, yeah, because, okay, (laughs) because of the rampant craziness of all this, all of these divorces that have been issued in Alabama may or may not be legal. So technically, this crew that's a very that's a very bad thing has defrauded residents of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and these quickie divorces that were granted in Alabama are now causing problems in all kinds of other states. Once those people get into remarriages sure. and divorces, sure. Because they're technically bigamists now? No, because maybe the paperwork from the Alabama divorce was actually never filed. Yikes. Okay. So to give you an idea, since 1966, these nine indicted people handle more than 5,600 divorce cases. 5,600. Because so many of these proceedings are not recorded, a lot of these divorces are declared null and void including Tina and Ario Nassis. Oh, my God. Like, there's court drama happening in every other state because... Yeah. Grifters kind of grift in Alabama. It's a mess. Oh, yeah. I mean, because if you remarry and then they realize your divorce did not actually happen, you are a bigamist. That's you absolutely correct. married to two people. So... This capital of divorce thing pretty much winds down with the indictment of these officials by 1970. But for 25 years, Alabama uh, was the wild, wild south and the divorce capital of the United States. That's funny. I wonder if the I wonder if it clamped down when it did, because that was when like first wave feminism was crashing and women were leaving bad marriages because for the first time they felt they had permission to. Oh, I don't know. And I'm sure that... Well, I mean, for 10 years, they'd been trying to revert the policy, and it had kind of gone away with just policing internally, Mm -hmm. but not in Geneva County, so I think they ruined it for everybody. That is fascinating. I'm sort of surprised there isn't a book about it or something, right? Like, that's just a... I was surprised that I'd never... History... This is PhD level trash candy, y'all. I had no idea. Yeah. No, I've never... It was a fascinating story. I'd never heard about that. So as trash cans go, I'm going to use the 1960 trash can value and call it 17,000 trash cans for the number of divorces granted in Alabama in 1960. That is, that is wild. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. They don't teach you that in Alabama history class. Uh-uh. No, I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe if you're in Mobile, maybe you grew up in Mobile, there are stories about celebrities oh tina onassis stayed there when she got her divorce maybe Pro- i mean for um, sure yeah that wow so uh-uh. there's your hidden secret fact about alabama that you probably didn't know do you have just a little bit of an update alabama does have a higher divorce rate than much of the nation they yeah. rank currently 16th in the nation with a 12.3 percent divorce rate compared to a 10.9 divorce rate nationally Also, an uncontested divorce in Alabama now takes about six to 10 weeks after everything has been signed by both spouses and filed with the court. Contested divorce can take anywhere from 30 days to months or years, depending on if there's a trial or not. And oh yeah, what is the highest divorce rate in our nation? Any guesses out there? Arkansas Mm. has the highest divorce rate. Hmm. Went all around the bend this week. That was a lot of fun. Apparently, you can do whatever you want in Alabama. At least until somebody catches you. Yeah. There yeah. you go. There you go. So, stars fell all over Alabama from 1945 to 1970, getting their quickie divorces. And there's your PhD level trash candy for the week. That is fascinating. Just a bunch of good old boy lawyers being like, we can make some money here, boys. <laughs> we can totally make some money. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I hope this first weekend of September Labor Day weekend is treating you well. Mm -hmm. We appreciate your time. Hope your football team is winning in the sports scene today. Have a great Labor Day. Keep it trashy. Keep it trashy, y'all. Keep it trashy. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.
Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia, for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith, and you can find more from her at sydneyvsmith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find out more about Ratsy at Ratsy's store on Instagram. Want to check out our sources, soundtracks, or other notable episode information? Visit trashydivorces.com. On the web, you can enjoy early ad-free releases, regular bonus stories, follow-ups, and more by joining us at patreon.com slash trashy divorces. We have merchandise available online too. Get your trashy divorces gear at bit.ly slash trashy merch. And thanks to What a Maneuver for doing such a great job with our cloths. Hey, we appreciate all of your ratings and reviews. If you do leave us a five-star review on iTunes, send us a little picture of it. Let us know and we'll ship you some Trashy Divorces stickers and such anywhere in the world. We got you. Because holy cat, y'all, we're now in 125 countries. 125 countries and counting. Thank you for listening. Thank you for telling your friends. Thanks for being awesome. You can send those emails for your free sticker swag to TrashyDivorces at gmail.com. And last but not least, check us out on social. We're at Trashy Divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs, Twitter, which I, Stacy, mostly run, and on Facebook, which we pretty much split. We also have a Trashy Divorces discussion group on Facebook if you want to chat with other Trashy Divorces listeners. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. Keep Keep it it trashy. trashy!